Hello, everyone. How's it going? Having a good time? Yeah. Having a good time? Yeah. There we go. Oh, who, is, is this all because of the party last night? Did everyone, you know, wake up feeling a little sorry this morning? Is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, hello. What's going on here? This will not stand. Just a moment. <sighs> Better. Right. Okay. Let's get on with it. Hello, my name is Simon. I'm from the UK. I have a little bit of a funny accent, so if you don't understand anything I'm saying at any point, just stick your hand up and say, I'll do my best. Now, uh, this is a talk that all happened because I get bored very easily. My wife thinks I don't get bored, but the reality is I get bored really, really easily. And what I'm good at is finding ways to fill time. And the pandemic happened a couple of years ago, and that was fun. And... Uh, <laughs> But what I thought I'd do is I'd find a whole load of things to do to keep myself busy and not go mm, crackers. So one of them is learning to draw. That, I did that. Yeah, you couldn't draw a straight line before the pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. No one's going to make a book of my work, but, you know, it's all right. It's fine. Um, I've been taught to teach myself the piano, which is, you know, it's going all right. And I thought I'd set myself a computing project. And this was it. I found the code of a really old computer game. I'm talking really old, as in older than Pong old, and converted it into modern functional style C sharp. And that's, that's kind of my, my, my area of interest. So my contact details are there in the unlikely event that anyone really wants to talk to me about this further. But feel free. <laughs> so first off, briefly, what is functional programming? Do we have any proper uh, FP guys in uh, here th uh, today? Ooh, this is going to be interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, what is functional programming? In brief, it is a paradigm, not a framework. Uh, things you pull off NuGet, those are frameworks. MVC is a framework. Functional programming is not. Functional programming is a paradigm. Now, what's that? It's a style of programming. It's a way of programming. If you want to take the metaphor of a guitar, you can play many types of music on it. Similarly, with C Sharp, you can develop in many paradigms. Object-oriented is one paradigm, and this is another. So, it's declarative, not imperative. What does that mean? Imperative is the style of programming that most of you probably grew up or um, learning to do. Uh, Object-oriented is an imperative style. This is where you are very concerned with the precise order of operations. We start here, we go here, we loop around like this. That's imperative. Declarative is less interested in that sort of thing. With declarative, we are more focused on what do you want at the end, I will describe it, the rest, frankly, is up to you. TSQL is a form of declarative programming. Look at the TSQL statement. What is the order of operations there? Select ain't the first thing that runs. It's probably the last in most cases. You get the idea, though. Do you care? Do you care which order it executes? No, you don't care. I don't care. The point is, I get what I want. And that's, that's the declarative style. That's what functional programming works like. So the properties of functional programming. Immutability. This means once you've set a variable, you cannot change it ever, ever. Um, think of programs written like the working when you did maths. I don't know if anyone did maths at you know, GCSE, A level, well, whatever, you call, whatever your schooling system is. You, you would write out your, your, uh, your working as first this, then this, then this, based, each one based on the previous step. That's roughly the style we work to. Oh. This is clearly not going to let me chat for very long. Fair enough. I'm going to just have to prod that once in a while. <laughs> right. Um, higher order functions. Sounds scary, isn't. Functions passed as variables, done. That's all it is. Uh, if you have passed in arrow expression, uh, arrow functions into link expressions, bang, that's higher order functions. That's all that is. And expressions rather than statements, well, what's that? Uh -huh. So an expression is something that results in a value. And a statement doesn't. So um, if statements, there you go, it's a statement, if for, where. It changes the order of execution. It doesn't actually assign a value to anything. It's a statement. Functional programming doesn't use them. Uh, I wrote this entire thing pretty much with no for loops, no while loops, or any of that. A ternary if is OK, because it is designed to assign a value into a variable. So that's acceptable. But no other kind of if is. Uh, referential transparency, that means Given the same set of parameters, a function will always give the same result no matter what, no matter anything. 
Uh, recursion, are you good with recursion? Good, recur good. going to be a tough talk otherwise. Uh, pattern matching, I used to have to explain what this is, but now C Sharp does it. It does it, switch expressions. Uh, as of the last few versions, that's pretty much pattern matching. F Sharp can do more with it, C Sharp can do most of it. It's still pretty awesome, and it's stateless. Uh, if anyone's worked with things like Redux, then you've probably got roughly an idea of how we handle state in functional programming, because Redux is based on principles of functional programming. In fact, I think it was directly modeled on uh, Elm. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Right, anyway, that is enough of the boring preamble. Let's get on. Oh, okay, why, 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 why? Yes, I suppose that is important. I suppose we should talk about why. What's the point? Why are we bothering? I actually particularly love that first one, reduced code noise. That means, it is much clearer what is the intent of this code over here is precisely how I assembled this thing at the end. When I am looking through a block of code, I don't really need to know exactly how did we do a loop and then an if and then assign this into a, a list bit by bit. I'm not really bothered. I just want to know how does it work. And functional programming is better for that. You can usually glance at a bit of functional programming and know pretty much what it's intending to do you can drill into the deeper details afterwards, and that's fine. Uh, something that's important for a lot of folks, it is more testable. Uh, it is entire based entirely around the concept of predictable behavior inside the code. It does not like unpredictable behavior. It doesn't like to change the suddenly the, the place that we are uh, uh, pointing at in our code base because there's been an unhandled exception. In fact, in strictly speaking, in a functional language, there is no concept of the unhandled exception or the throw. Those concepts don't really exist. now. We're still in C-sharp, so we're going to have to deal with them, but there we go. And it's predictable. What you tend to get is better systems. There is, um, it is alleged by some functional languages that once their, their programs go up, they, they can't be brought down no matter what. And that might well be true, but uh, again, within certain parameters, this is still C-sharp. And it's better support for concurrency, so if you're wanting to, there's no state. So you don't tend to get things like resource contention happening anywhere near as much. So if you're interested in things like uh, serverless or in having a whole load of uh, Docker containers can processing off the same queue, stuff like that, functional tends, don't you dare, functional tends to support it really well. Right. This is a pretty picture, isn't it? I didn't draw this one. Uh, but this is, the, this is a demonstration of shadows. And that's an important concept when dealing with uh, functional C-sharp, believe it or not. There are two parts to a shadow. Well, I'm learning to draw. I know there's more than two before anyone sticks their hand up. There's about 12. But I'm only really interested in two, and that is the umbra and penumbra. The umbra, if you look at any shadow that happens to be conveniently close at hand, uh, your own, for example, um, you'll notice there are two parts. There's the dark, solid part in the middle, and then the gray, fuzzy bit around the outside. That's the penumbra. And that's kind of how I have to think when I'm doing functional C-sharp. It is not a purely functional language. It never will be. There are functional features that are never going to be supported by C-sharp. If you want to go 100% all the way out with functional, you'll probably have to look into something like F-sharp or go crazy, go learn Haskell, whatever. That's fine. But in C-sharp, we are going to have to compromise at some point. Now, my aim is to minimize the amount of compromise, push that gray area as far away as we can, and maximize the lovely solid um, functional bit in the middle. But that's still the idea that I want to keep in my head. So I have had to compromise here and there because I have to. It's just the way it is. And I'll try and point out some of those examples as we go along. So on to this game. First off, what even is Oregon? I have to admit, well, I'm from the UK. I'd never heard of Oregon. Apologies, is anyone from Oregon? Good, good. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that's, that's it, incidentally, if anyone's interested. There's Oregon. There we go. It's up uh, between was that Washington and, uh, and California. It's a state of America, and that's where this game that I converted is set, the Oregon Trail. Um, what is Oregon known for? Well, I have to admit, very beautiful scenery. I don't think there are any software development conferences in Oregon. If there are, I am interested. This, this looks nice. I don't know where these places are. I grabbed these off the internet, but yeah. Uh, come on, come around. There we go. Thank you. Oh dear. Re really, right? Nike. It has to be based somewhere, doesn't it? Apparently, Oregon. Apparently, that's where it is. Uh, named after the Greek goddess of victory. In case anyone was curious, you are welcome. The Goonies. Anyone remember this one? 
yeah, I spent a good chunk of my childhood watching this film that is frankly really unsuitable for children, but way, I did watch it. And uh, it is set in Oregon, in a part of Oregon called the Goondocks, hence the Goonies. I did wonder about that name as a kid, now you know the answer. But there we go, that's, that's everything I know about Oregon, now you know it too. You are, thank you, yes. Right, and the Oregon Trail, this is the Oregon Trail. This was uh, something that happened, again, my American history is pretty sketchy, going to be honest, but from what I gather, it was a migration that happened from one coast of America to the other over a series of routes that were designed to be traversed by these covered wagons pulled by oxen, that is, uh, the, the cows there, and, you know, various bits of fun and adventure were had on the way. That's it. That's the, it starts down at the bottom near the source of the, I think it was the Missouri River, and it goes all the way over to the west coast uh, where things settle in Oregon. This is the South Pass because the last bit of the trail was a mountain range that had to be traversed, and there was a pass that happened to go through it, so that is a feature of the game as well. And if you look there, you can see some guys uh, with their guns shooting some, I, I guess it meant to be deer or something for food. And believe it or not, there is a shooting minigame in this. There is no visuals in this game whatsoever, but they managed to include a shooting minigame. Now, how might they have done that? Well, I'll get back to that. I will show you, but have a ponder. How on earth do you do that with no visual display unit? But yes, they did it. And forts. This was also a feature because periodically you could stop at forts to trade for, for, for goods and that sort of thing. So great. That's, that's the history. Uh, but move forward quite a long time to the 90, I think it's the late 60s, this guy. His name's John Kemney. He was a, I think he was a Hungarian mathematician and apparently a really brilliant one. I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know too much about that. But has anyone ever heard the, the cliche about Einstein not being terribly good at maths? He's the guy that said it. He was one of the guys that worked, I think he was uh, uh, one of the human calculators that worked with Einstein. He worked with the physicist John Feynman, uh, again, doing, doing maths and number crunching. He was, in his day, apparently a very brilliant mathematician and he became the head of mathematics at uh, Dartmouth University in America. And he had two particular obsessions that he was trying to follow. And um, one, well, one really, and that was computers. He was rather obsessed with the idea of computers. He wanted computers to be a feature of the maths course. He, and not only that, he wanted everyone to be able to have a go at the computers. Now, bearing in mind, this was the late 60s, and computers were probably, what, the size of this room? Not everyone could fit one in their house. It would have been tricky, but um, not impossible, but tricky. Uh, but this, this is something he wanted to get around. So there we go. He got in touch with this guy, one of his colleagues. His name is Thomas Kurtz. And they implemented two very brilliant ideas. The first was time sharing. They didn't invent it. Time sharing goes back to the 1950s, but this was a famous example of it. There, this was the idea that you had one computer, and it was down in the basement, wherever it was, and in the old days, what you would have to do is get your punch cards, hand them into a chap that worked at the door of the room, and then he would bundle them all up into a batch, hence batch processing, that's where it comes from, and uh, then come back in a week or so when he's fed all of it through the machine, and it gives you a thing back that says it worked or it didn't work. Uh, can you imagine how long that would take these days <laughs> to get anything done when we will probably try and fail about 12 times a minute before we're, we're ha anyway. That was one of the things. Time sharing was the idea that there were loads of terminals dotted all around the campus and the big computer was literally switching its attention from one place to the other in, uh, in some sort of sequence. So everyone could feel like they were interacting with the computer in something like real time, but they weren't. It was kind of an illusion, but it meant there is a terminal, you can sit at it and use it. So it's, it made it possible for everyone to just sit and have a play around with the computer. And the other brilliant idea they had was they thought that the programming languages of the time were not terribly friendly. This is uh, Fortran and COBOL. I, has anyone ever seen Fortran or COBOL? They, 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 yeah, yeah, a couple. They're not very friendly, are they? <laughs> no, they're not. Tr I found some books at my university and I put them down not long after I opened them. Um, but they wanted something that everyone could use. So they came up with uh, the basic all-purpose symbolic instruction code, or BASIC. We, there's a bit of BASIC. Anyone think that's a good idea? Should I run this? What do you think will happen? Uh, this is an infinite loop, in case anyone's interested. There's a couple of interesting features of BASIC. Every single line starts with a line number. 
This means that you can reference lines by their number. The second line there means stop what you were doing and go back to line 10. Then it will go to 20, back to 10. So yeah, this is just the sort of thing you do in, in computer classes in the old days to annoy the teacher. Um, but it, it is possible. The other feature was they wanted every single command to start with a verb. It was part of uh, one of their it was one of their principles to try and make the code easy to understand to the extent that um, even comments are verbs. It's rem for remark. So you couldn't even just do slash slash. No, everything had to be a verb and then the parameters that followed the verb after it. And that's what it looked like. And also they had a controversial idea, would you believe? And that was to include this keyword, input. It seems strange now, but this was controversial in its day. There were people, because bearing in mind that in many ways, computing comes from the maths world. And those guys thought, well, surely you just feed all of the input in at the beginning, let the computer do its thing and get the answer out. And that's what a computer will do. Why would you stop execution midway to let some silly sod fat finger a response and enter in? Why would you do that? But this is something they pushed for. And the very next thing that happened is everyone started developing computer games. Because of course they did. And apparently there were tons of them all over the university campus. Uh, since it was kind of one computer, they could just share. You basically save them to the computer and then everyone can access them. And uh, the apparently there were computer games that simulated American football. How accurately I could only speculate. And various other ones. Um, but also the one that, uh, that we're dealing with here. This was, uh, this was 1971 that we this is one of the sorts of machines that they uh, that um, was used. This is an HP Timeshare Basic uh, terminal, or whatever it would have been called. And this is what Oregon Trail was written and played on. Now, what you'll see here is this is a typewriter and a printer, is what it is. It has no screen. There was no concept of the online VDU in those days. You sat there and typed it, and then when the code said print, it meant it. It printed. <laughs> That is how it was. So, yeah, there's... An, see, that's, that's interesting. How on earth, yeah, seriously, how on earth do you do a, um, a shooting minigame? You'll see, you'll see. Be prepared for mild disappointment, probably, but it does. <laughs> we'll see. And that moves us on a few years to these three, these three gentlemen here, uh, Don Rorich, Bill Heinemann, and Paul Dillenberg. So they were student teachers at uh, a university in Minnesota. And they were teaching a course on the Oregon Trail, on the history of it. And they had the bright idea of, why don't we make a computer game based on this to teach the students? And not only was it popular with their students, but it became a hit across the entire campus. Flipping everyone was playing this thing that was connected into, into their campus, but still. It was, it was phenomenally popular. And it's, you know, actually, it is quite fun. And, um, but the original 1971 version is lost. They didn't preserve it. It was wiped at the end of the semester. It's lost to posterity. But in 1975, uh, a Minnesotan education company, these guys, um, they got in touch and said, would you mind redoing it, and we'll actually distribute this thing? And that is the 1975 version, and that's what I found on the internet. It's quite easy to find this source code on the internet. It's about 6,000 lines of code long, and it, it did take me a while. Um, but yeah, that is, that's, and it's, this is kind of one of the first examples of both shareware and educationware and various other things, and that's, that's, that's kind of neat. Uh, th as I say, this is before Pong and all the rest of it. Commercial computer games wasn't really a thing at this point. That's what it actually looks like if you play it on a more modern computer. Uh, basically, you're just doing everything with text. It's telling you what happened. You're entering values into, uh, and you make your choices with integers. When it presents you with a list of options down the bottom there, it says, do you want to hunt? We'll press one. Do you want to continue? Press two, and, and so on. That's pretty much how the whole game looks. You can enter values. Uh, there are one or two places where you have to enter some text, but that's relatively limited, probably because in those days, text parsing was especially complicated. That's what the structure of a turn looked like. I don't know if that's very visible to you. But basically, you've got the start of it, the setup at the beginning, where you make you've got like I think seven hundred dollars, and uh, you make various purchases. You start off, and then we go into a great big loop, 
where we begin the turn, you've got options to hunt, visit the fort, continue on. Then there are a sequence of randomized events where there may be riders on the uh, road ahead of you. Uh, there's all sorts of other random events. We hit the mountains, which may or may not be reached yet. If you haven't reached the mountains, that will be skipped. Have we reached Oregon? Uh, if not, then we'll go back and so on until you are either dead or you reach Oregon, whichever is first. I, I don't know which is worse. I've never been to Oregon, but I'm sure it's lovely. I'm sure that going to Oregon is much nicer than death, I hope. I don't know. Anyway, uh, and incidentally, I don't know if anyone's played the modern iterations of Oregon Trail. This game series is still going. It's still going. I think the last version was released just a couple of years ago. Uh, not in this form. It, I think it's got lovely 3D graphics and all that, but um, there is a cliche that uh, you, uh, was it you die of dysentery all the time in, in Oregon Trail. Well, not in this version. That's the later ones. You can only die of two things in this version of Oregon Trail. You can die of pneumonia or injuries. Uh, cheery. But that's it. That's the only ways. Uh, this is what the beginning of the code looks like. I put a little bit of color in there just to make it slightly easy to read. So they were quite good, those guys. They, they did put some rems, some comments in there to try and help me because, to be honest, it probably would have taken me another year to decode this. Because uh, I don't know if you can see on line 30 there, that's creating an array, the dim. Dim still used in VB, by the way, I believe. Uh, at least in VB6 it was. It dates all the way back to the original basic. And for whatever reason, uh, variables in basic programs what tended to be single letter or maybe two letters. I don't know if it was to save memory or, or what, but meaningful variable names is really not a thing in these old games. It's pretty consistent that way. So C string, that dollar is a string incidentally. That's marking the fact that this is string data, which is also an array. There is no distinction between arrays and strings in these. And um, it's checking whether you want to see the instructions. And the if statement's also weird. Ifs are always the reverse logic to what we expect, and this caused me some particular headaches. Because in modern languages, it's if this is true, then carry on and do these bits. In basic, it's if this is true, don't do these bits and skip ahead. So the Boolean logic is pretty much always the reverse, and I had to do some real staring at some of these bits to understand what in heck I'm supposed to do with it. Um, but I've already done it for you, so you're welcome. Uh, right, and then this was actually asking you whether you want to see the instructions for the game or not. If you don't, and it's kind of a bug here, because if you literally, if you type no, then we'll skip. If you type anything else at all, it will give you the instructions in full. It, uh, it, it's a very old game. It's, what, nearly 50 years old, so it's, you can't really quite hold it to modern standards. It's also case sensitive, so type no in lowercase and... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are we... Are we, d no, are we, there we go. This thankfully was at the end as well. This is basically a key to all the variables. This is telling me what all of them actually mean and this was flipping in, uh, invaluable. Uh, and actually my mistake, it's, uh, it's about 5,000 lines of code that I had to go through over, over this to get this done. Some of these are Boolean flags, I've had a lot of them and there's various input stores and things like that. So let's get on to a bit of programming. So this is my design. So here is my player, see, look how happy they are. You see how happy they are? It's because they're playing Oregon Trail. That's how good it is. <laughs> and uh, so I need to simulate this. I need to make this predictable, and I need to make this so that uh, there are no side effects. There's nothing more impure than a human being. Human beings are very hard to predict. Um, and first off, easy peasy, let's throw in an eye console. That's easy. That's pretty standard, so we can, we can inject a console. But I also want to capture a few things about the sort of input that the user is going to give me. Now, they could give me some text, or they might not. It might be an integer, or it might not. There's all these considerations. And normally, in imperative code, what you would do is you just sort of shove the raw input, and then wherever it's received, you would make that part of the code have a look and a think about what to do. In functional, there's better ways of doing it. There's ways of stacking up that sort of information in the structure of the code. So. This is the three states that I identified coming out of the console. There could be something in there. That is, they actually typed something and pressed enter or whatever it would be called. They just pressed enter and there was nothing there whatsoever, in which case that's not a valid state. Or an error occurred. I, I actually don't know if you can get errors straight off the console. They must be possible. But still, it is a possibility, so I should capture that state. And I don't want an unexpected error to occur and just absolutely bungle the rest of the game. 
And that's how I, that's how I described it. I created a base class uh, called maybe, and it's got a T on it, meaning that it contain anything. What it is, is, is a box. It's a thing in a box. That's all it is, thing in a box. And then I inherited off that with a class called nothing. That is, there is nothing in the box. So anything receiving this will see it's got nothing on the side, ain't opening the box. What's the point? There's nothing in it. Uh, if Amazon ever sent me a box like that, though, I, would, I, I wouldn't be terribly happy, shall we say. Uh, but otherwise, then there's the something. That means there is something, so I create a value there. I'm creating at that point because I don't want value to be in nothing or maybe because I don't want it to persist to all the other states where the concept of the value has no meaning. If uh, There cannot be a value field if there is no value because it's a nothing. And then finally, an error. And in that, there is no value because it didn't work, but it is an error. So I've captured the error. And uh, there we go. Right, sorted. So that's, uh, this is called, by the way, a discriminated union, if you want the technical term. That is what it is called. Uh, F Sharp has a system for just creating these on the fly. C Sharp doesn't. So we have to kind of botch it with an abstract base class and some inheritance. But still, this is how I do a read line. So what I'm saying returning out of this is a maybe of string. Now, what that maybe means is, now, bear in mind, the maybe is just a box with a thing inside it. And at this point, we don't know really what's coming out of it. But by saying maybe in the signature, what I'm saying is, I don't know if this will return. It might have something in it. It might not. It might be an error. I don't know. All I'm saying is, this could have what you want or it could not. And you'll have to have a look to see whether it's there. Um, so I've got my try catch around that. And this is just about one of the only try catches in the entirety of my code base. I have to put something around here. This is interfacing with something low level and beyond the control of my system. So I have to try and try catch around that to stop that from escalating anywhere else. Um, and then we have the read line and a check to see, is it null or white space? So basically, I never really need to do another white space or null check ever again on strings, not from the console, because this has captured it. And it's captured it by being one type of object or the other. And if it's an error, then well, you'll go into the catch and turn into an error, and we'll just pass the error along. And that's an example of how I'd consume it. Now, this is our pattern matching. This is, as of the uh, most recent few versions of C Sharp, we can match on type. So if I wanted a user input, I could uh, do a read line, and then I'll just switch. And then based on the type, I will know exactly how to handle it. Easy peasy. So again, the whole idea of having to do the uh, is null or white space check all over the place, don't need to. Don't need to put any more try catches because if anything came out of the console, then the read line would capture it internally and return something to you that indicated there was a problem, and then you could choose how to react if you want to. Uh, also, this is, I've, I've called it operation. I mean, you can call it what you like. Uh, not like the, the, the game with the man with the big nose and the, the, the tweezers, not that sort of operation. Um, but this is, this is the same sort of concept, but there's no return value coming out of it. All I want to indicate is success or failure. Uh, in the old days, well, I say in the old days, I mean, I see this at work all the time. The alternative to this sort of thing would typically be like maybe an object with metadata attached to it where there would be a, was it a success? Yes, no. There's an error which might be null. Here's a value which might be null. I think this is much cleaner. You will never see a field you don't need in any case. And we can do a try operation. This is a, uh, so this is something I attached to everything. It's an extension method which attaches to a generic, so attaches to everything. So if I ever just want to carry out an action using a value, I can just call try operation, and then the return value will tell me if it succeeded or it didn't. And if it failed, it'll also attach the error message so that we can consume it if we need to. There. And there's... There's my nice all-in-one system for writing and receiving from the console. I use params, because you should use params. Params is cool. Um, and that's my message. That's all written out to the console. Now, I have to do a for each here, because so far as I am aware, there is no way to write an array of strings into right line. So I have to for each. So this is one of those examples where I simply have to um, compromise. Uh, but I'm only doing this once, and it's wrapped then into a signature which is entirely functional, and I find that absolutely acceptable. Right, there's my nice smiley happy player. And I always, this is, I didn't realize I baked this in, uh, baked in this was, but the entire time I was doing this, I had to really hold myself back from calling them the user. Because that's just what I have spent the last 16 years calling them, the user. No, it's the player. 
They're the player. They are playing my game. And it's, it's, uh, so I might slip a few more times when we do this, but it should be player, really. But I'll put an extra level after this. So this is um, another level of uh, discriminated union. So the something actually then subdivides into two different types. And which of those types it is could be a potential error state that I need to handle. And that is that the user entered text or a number, an integer. Most of the time, I have to enforce that it must be an integer, most of the time. So if I expect integer, but get, uh, but get back text like someone typed O-N-E instead of one, that's an error state. And I actually have to feed back and do something about it. Um, but again, by doing it with a discriminated union, that's baked in. I don't need to keep doing that uh, int dot try parse all over the shop. I just need to do it the once. There we go. So base, same basic thing. And also, because I have got the states with the correct typing, I don't need to do um, any conversion of types, because if it is an integer, then you will get back integer input as a type, and it will already have a value which is wrapped to the correct type of integer, and that's saved a colossal amount of code. There. That's, the sort of, that's what it looks like inside. So read, um, write something out, uh, read the result back, check whether it was a failure, um, if it wasn't a failure, then we'll, we'll do a read line and then pass that along to something which is going to take the result of that read and uh, check if it was an error, then we're not going to bother doing anything. There was an error, so we're not going to even try doing the next step. Uh, and then do a try parse there, and that will get me my, my integer type. So that's the only, even though I need string turned into integer almost constantly, this is the only int.try parse in my entire code base. There, and that's my replication of that first block of code you saw. It's just, uh, do you need instruction? And then do a switch to say, if it was a text input, and converting it to uppercase, because look, I put a bug fix in for them. Uh, I hope they're happy. So if it was a yes, because I have to reverse all the logic, then um, uh, there we go. That's a true, so we will display the, um, we will display the instruction following this. And that's, I've also created another extension method here. Uh, well, well, there's an if. There's an if. So, yes, I ha would normally have to do an if like that. And if there's only one value inside here, I'm not going to lose any sleep. That's not strictly functional. That is a statement. That but, you know, I, I went all out on this. So I created a, a function called write message conditional, which took a Boolean, and then based on that Boolean, decided whether to write a message or not. So that really is very functional indeed. That might be a step too far, but it was a challenge to myself, so I went for it. There we go, and that's the whole thing. <sighs> Do my uh, write out to this user. Do you need instructions? If they say yes, then write message conditional based on the result of the display instructions and any errors or anything like that will actually result in not an error happening. But uh, I probably could have put an error, display the error to the console, but at the very least it won't try and uh, write if there's a problem going on. But anyway, literally all of the circumstances other than them entering an actual value which is not a number, will result and is actually equal to yes in either case will result in the message being displayed. Woo. So, on to infantry management. This was a slightly trickier and did require some recursion because there's a whole load of looping involved in this. There is basically a form that you have to fill in one item at a time. There's no backs or anything like that. You do have to go through it in order. It, um, you really probably need to work it on a piece of paper first. But this is my, my inventory. I'm making a record type now. I don't know if everyone's come across record types, but record types are absolutely brilliant. The nice thing about they are kind of like a class except they're passed by value, not reference. And also, you can create a new record based on the old, just changing one value. And that means we don't need to ever change the value of the old version. We can just create a new one and a new one and a new one and just change its value each time. That's, that's all part of our um, immutability and stateless system. And that's, I've used that quite a lot. So there are five, is that five items there. There's the oxen team. They pull your carts. So having more of them will make you go faster. Food, well, yeah, you need that every day, three times if you can get it. Ammunition for, for shooting people uh, or, or animals, because, you know. Uh, clothing and miscellaneous supplies. Now, it calls it this in the game, miscellaneous supplies. It consistently, in all the comments, called it miscellaneous supplies. It's actually medical equipment. 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether they, they, they had a change of mind or what happened there, but it is actually medical equipment. You use it whenever there's an injury or an illness in your party. So, fine. But my aim was to replicate the original as close as I could, so I kept their naming conventions. And that's roughly the sequence of this opening thing. So, we start off with choosing oxen. There are two different validation messages if you get it wrong. It must be between 200 and 300. That's dollars spent. You have 700. Uh, moving on then to food, which must be a value greater than zero. Sorry, equal to or greater than zero. Apparently, in the 1971 version, there was a bug that allowed for a negative value to be put in there. So, you could spend negative $2,000 on each of these and go home rich. But... Um, <laughs> I wish it were that simple, but it is not. Trust me, I've tried. Now, ammo, yeah, and then clothes and miscellaneous. Again, all of those have the same validation message, and that is simply that you have to try again if you entered a negative value. And then finally, we do our total spend check, and if you have spent over $700, you go back and do the whole thing again in sequence. Oh. Um, so... Whether this is the perfect answer, I don't know, but this is what I've done. Um, I've started with a get input to say, how much do you want to spend on your oxen team? And I've got a, well, this is not yet functional. I've got a while true. This is uh, a slightly more imperative way of dealing with this problem. Do a while true, and then we can break out of this if, uh, if a valid thing is, is reached. Now, that's not ideal for me, given that I want to make this in really functional. So I've got to find another way of doing this. And, but I mean, broadly, that's, that code is fine. You know, really, if I came across this at work, I wouldn't be too troubled, but this is the challenge. So one option is something like this. And this is basically using recursion. Now, recursion's not a great idea in C-sharp. Well, it, it can be. It can be. If you're fairly sure that you're only going to recurse a couple of times, it's probably fine. But the stack has a tendency to explode if you do too much at once. So this is doing things like um, do my oxen spend. If it was an invalid, call the, the base function again to basically start again. Um, it, it, this is functional, but it's probably not an ideal choice in, uh, in C sharp. Now, in F sharp, there is actually something called uh, sort of tail optimized recursion calls where you can recurse as much as you like and go wild and it'll kind of deal with it for you and that's fine. In C sharp, probably shouldn't. Not unless you're sure. So, uh, this is kind of, yeah, this is one of these areas where I've ended up compromising again, but at least this looks nice and functional. I created a function, an extension method called iterate until. And that means here is a function and I want you to carry on trying again and again, basically retries. Try this as many times as you can until I get what I want. And I have defined that as an integer input, um, which has a value between 200 and 300. And it will keep on trying until we get the expected result. And funnily enough, if you see at the bottom there, the compiler is moaning about the final input, wrapping that in into an integer input. It actually, by definition, will always be an integer input or an infinite loop if the user just keeps in successfully typing this stuff in. But um, I know for fact because that's the only exit condition from that function I will allow, but the compiler is not quite clever enough to notice. So that's, that's interesting, but uh, mm, uh, there we go. But that's actually what's behind it. It's a while loop. Like I said, I had to compromise. And I could have done this recursively. You saw how that might have looked. You can but it's not really a good idea. So there are all sorts of other ways of doing this. I have seen some very clever people look into it, and I saw uh, an article on the internet once where they suggested you could run, you could do the recursion, and then you can actually t go into the common language and interfere at a low level with the common language and make it an F-sharp style tail-optimized recursion call post-build, you could do that, I suppose. That's very clever, and I'm most impressed. But realistically, am I going to do that? No, no I'm not going to. It's, it sounds like too much hard work. So at least with this approach, I have got a functional style interface. And if something comes along one day, I'll replace this, and then we're good. Uh, the other option I looked into was um, uh, you can reference F-sharp libraries from C-sharp 
but I spoke to some very clever uh, F-sharp people, and they assured me that that was probably not a great idea, either not for this sort of approach, because there apparently there's some prob there it's, it's, some le it's not an entirely efficient way to, uh, to get done what I want. So fine, I will trust them. I don't know F-sharp. So. And there we go. Get a non-zero spend. That's my generic version of the rest of them. Each of them have the same basic idea. We want to spend, which is not zero. The only thing that changes is the item name. Um, and I can do it uh, by just stitching in the item name there and returning back out there. And then finally, that's how I st stitched it all together. Now, um, I, I'm basically creating an array, an array of items with an enum at one side and a spend on the other side. And uh, I'm iterating through and then looking for what was the most recent thing that you got. Well, then I know which is the next in the queue. Then I'll just go and do that one next. And uh, the, the oxen spend is at the beginning. And then there we go. So basically, whatever, whatever you don't have, whatever the next item you don't have in the list, based on the array, I'll go and get that for you next based on that, uh, that prev.max. I could run that seven times and then gradually build up an enumerable containing all the spends. And then, having done that, that's my iterate until to say that the count is five, meaning I've got everything. Do a sum. If it's greater than 700, then we can say uh, it's overspent now. That actually is recursion. That's true recursion. In this case, I didn't feel too bad using real recursion because I am thinking that to go through the entire form, all five things from beginning to end, um, if you've done that more than two or three times, I think the player is likely to just flip the, the keyboard over and go off and do something productive with their time. So I'm not too concerned. But with the others, there might well be a few goes. So that's fine. Uh, that, to me, is a perfectly acceptable solution. There may be others, but uh, this works for me. And that's actually the state of the how I do the play. This is the, uh, when I talk about how um, functional programming is nice and concise, this is a lovely example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. This screen very closely mirrors the, uh, the diagram I showed, the flow diagram that I showed you before. Um, I created um, a function called uh, uh, continue game. And that actually wraps a little bit of logic that says, should I continue the game? So at each one of these function calls, those are all function calls, by the way. And all of those functions take the game state object and then convert it into a new game state object based on the old one. They don't modify it. They create a new one and chuck the new one back um, based on whatever new changes should have happened. So the game state object is not like in uh, empirical code, where it's a single object that's passed around the entire system and modified. Uh, what we're actually doing is constantly generating new game state objects and chucking the old one away. Again, uh, anyone that's ever worked in Redux, this is probably nothing new to you. Um, but so what I'm saying is iterate until, what's that? Uh, what I'm doing is iterating until, and at the bottom there, you can see my, uh, my condition. I've put a com I've kind of put an extra new line after the comma there just to make it a little clearer, but it's game over. If this Boolean value game over is true, what is that? Okay. Oh. So I need to mute their phone. Um, right. So any anyway, so we're, we'll try and continue to get, we'll, no. Um, so at each stage, we do some modifications. We do handling eating. There's uh, a block there which is to do with updating with a, a new mileage um, based on how many oxen we have and various other things. Uh, riders on the trail, I'll get to that in a minute. Random events, cross mountain, all that sort of thing, which may or may not create a new uh, state. But if, if at any point any of these states results in you dead, uh, then the continue game will not execute the function it's passed. It will just simply allow that state at that point to be preserved and passed around until we reach the bottom where it says game is over so we can terminate the iterate until. This is an incredibly super ultra simplified version of a concept called a monad. It's not a true monad. There are some other, there's another extra property that needs, but so before any FP guys get shouting at me, it's not a true monad, it's true, but it's something very close to it. That's what continue game looks like. It's a tiny little thing, but very useful. All it says is that if the game is over or you are dead, whichever comes first, then um, if either of those are true, simply return the old state again unmodified. If either of those is true, then 
sorry, is not true. If both of those are not true, then run the function and generate the new game state based on the old. So I did a few other pictures, and there's no way I'm not going to use them. I never actually had one of those. I always wanted one. So this is as, this drawing this is as close as I ever got to actually having one. Um, it's probably better this way. I'm going to imagine how brilliant they could must have been and not think of how really disappointing they'll be if I ever get to play with one now. But uh, this is the, the, the illustrious shooting minigame. So how do we do it? How do you do a shooting minigame in an entirely text-based system? Well, here's how you do it. Right. Um, so what happens is there is a probability roll uh, based on how many seconds it took you to type the word bang. <laughs> Genius! And you know, it actually is quite fun. Uh, luckily, I'm quite, uh, quite good at typing, having basically started on computers with no mouse that were keyboard only, so I could type pretty fast. So I'm basically a crack shot at this game. It's great. Um, but yeah, so any mistyping of the word bang, as in misspelling it, will result in a default of seven seconds, which is the worst time. And any time you take over seven seconds will also be rounded down to seven which is considered the worst. If you got it in less than a second, then that's considered a crack shot and you get like bonus food if you're hunting for deer or uh, you've got a really good shot on the guy if you're, if, if you're shooting a baddie or, or whatever they might be. It's not very clear who these people you're shooting are and it's probably best not to dwell on it either. But, uh, <laughs> um, but what I did to try and make this predictable and functional is I injected a time service. Now, that is just basically datetime.now, but I've, I've wrapped it into an interface so that I can inject my own values, which means I can test this, because one of my goals was 100% unit test coverage, which I have achieved. Um, so And then the player interaction, which is a wrapper for that uh, discriminated union you saw where I'm doing consoles. And I'll take the start time, um, take their input, having given them the message type bang, check that it's a text input and that the uppercase version of that is bang, and then we'll do a hit which is based on uh, uh, the time taken. Sorry, we return the time taken, and then I think there are various other bits of logic that decide how exactly to apply the time taken. Uh, this was actually a function-ish in BASIC. BASIC doesn't really have a concept of functions. It has something called a, uh, it's a command called go sub as in go subroutine, which would kind of mean go to this place and then go back. But really all it's doing is jumping to this line of code and back. If you're not careful, you could have one function bleeding into another. Uh, that's, the, that's the joy of basic. So the next section, riders on the trail ahead. Uh, anyone remember the big guy? Anyone remember him? Brave Star? No, I think I'm the only person that remembers it. But it was kind of cool. It was like the Wild West in space. And this guy was like Brave Star's horse and his buddy who carries this gigantic gun to shoot uh, shoot folks with. Uh, I remember it. Uh, everyone, everyone remembers the flipping little guys, though. <laughs> Apparently, they're still popular. Oh, well. Right, riders on the trail ahead. This, you would not believe how long this took me. I mean, it took a long time, because there are multi-stages of random generation of numbers, each of which has an influence, because what you have to do is multiple steps. So first, are there riders? Do they look friendly? And then, were your suspicions correct? There are three different random numbers before you finally get presented with a choice of what to do. And that sounds fairly simple, but that's because I spent about three weeks staring at it and making notes to work out what this was all meant to mean. Uh, but there you go. The art, uh, it's, it is a surprisingly complicated game, especially with stuff like this. Now, there's a great big like, binomial equation there, and that was designed to vary as you go around along the trail how likely it is or not to encounter riders. At certain points, they wanted it to be more likely, and certain points less. Now, apparently, there were some historical significance to this, these bits with the more riders in. I don't know, but that's what that's all about. I charted it, and it's sort of it's a funny little graph, but yeah, anyway. Basically, if that evaluates to true, then there are riders and we do the encounter riders subroutine. Otherwise, we'll just return the old unmodified state. And there's, there's my, my version of the riders. Again, I've done it with just one variable based on the elast and stuff like that. Do some random numbers. Again, RND, that's my random number generator, which is another injected interface because I can't really use a real one. That would be unpredictable. Um, are the 
Are they, do they look friendly? Are they what they seem? I think mine's a bit easier to follow. And then based on whether there are riders and you decide to do something, you've got your choices. And then there's a great big long list down there of based on whether the riders were friendly or not, actually, not whether they looked and all that, we can throw that away now, and what choice the player made, then we can make a modification to state. So the most of the first block are, we'll just make a modification to mileage. So return the old state, rather return a copy of the state, which has a couple of modifications, like how far you traveled. Maybe if you just ran for it, you travel more miles, stuff like that. But the last three were more complicated and each one needed an actual subroutine and quite often pulling out the good old um, shooting mini game to, to blast those riders by P, A, and G. There you know. Uh, right. And then, yeah, some right conditionals. And there's an is dead. There you go. That's what. That's an actual dead condition. And um, I think that was, yes, it was based on you ran out of bullets. So if you try to shoot the riders and you have no bullets left, you're just considered dead. So that's one way to end the game quite quickly. <sighs> so that's kind of a quick skim through my code. There's a load more to it. I think it's on GitHub. I, I'll, I'll try and get the latest version up. It has a few bugs in it at the moment, but it's basically playable. So there were a few bits that I tried to do, um, and there's some bits that I just I couldn't quite. Now, apparently, people have told me since I started doing this talk that this is possible. But uh, you see that sort of little comma seven thing in the middle of the string there? Now, what that was was a special character that meant ding a bell. So the printer, the sort of printery interfacey thing, had a little bell inside it. And every time it encountered um, apostrophe seven, it went ding. I've, I've not seen a video. I'm, I'm imagining the ding. But uh, I'm, it'd be something like you, ding, finally arrived, ding, vd, at or a ding, gun city. Uh, someone did suggest this might be playing a tune. I don't know if that's true. If anyone ever finds a video, let me know. I'd be interested to know. But that's what that is. Now, I've heard tell there may be still a bell character in, in ASCII, and I'm not quite sure what it'll do, but it'd need me actually to do some rewriting because the old version worked by literally writing each character one at a time, and the new version, my one now, currently works by just dumping the whole line in one go. So I probably have to go and put a little extra for loop in to, to make this happen. So that might be in the next version, so we'll see. It depends how much effort I really think that's worth. Um, and this is a future project I'm considering. This is the very first computer game that was ever made of Star Trek. Yeah, again, made for that sort of basic. Now this is a little bit more complicated. We've actually got a map and you can f the little E there represents the Enterprise flying around, blowing up other ships, which is entirely in keeping with the spirit of Star Trek. No, it isn't. I'm being sarcastic. But, you know, yeah, this, this looks like a fun and interesting little game and a bit of history, too. There were, believe it or not, well, considering when this it came about, i.e. late 60s, early 70s, there are actually quite a few old basic Star Trek games. Uh, so this is, this is an interesting little bit of Star Trek history preserved here. And that one might be fun, but this looks a lot more complicated. So that's, that's probably going to take me a year or two to get finished. Watch this space for this talk, Mark II, with Star Trek. Now, I, as anyone who knows me knows, I am a massive fan of Doctor Who. I don't know whether anyone's familiar with, with Doctor Who. Uh, if you look in the dictionary, it is the best TV series in the whole world. It actually is. I'll find anyone that says otherwise. <laughs> but uh, there was, in the early 80s, a text-based game of Doctor Who called Doctor Who and the Warlord. There is no picture of the Doctor there because they were changing him at the time and they didn't want to get out of date. But this is so huge that they actually had to basically compress the game into blocks. And the game works by loading up and then uncompressing blocks of itself into living memory and then moving on to other blocks. And that's incredible. And it's an amazing way around the limitations of the old system, but it's really complicated. And it's a huge game, but that might be an interesting challenge. So that again might be part three, who knows? See me at NDC. And Zork, has anyone played Zork? Yeah, cool. Did you get eaten by a Gru? Did you? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great game. If anyone really wants to have a go at a good text adventure, give that one a go. It's brilliant. Um, it's one of the early, really, truly great games. And, and also, uh, one of the others that's worth a go if you're interested in text-based games is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. Now, it is an exercise in frustration. Uh, the f it is an achievement in life if you get off the first screen. 
You basically wake up hungover, in bed, unable to grab anything because you're so hungover. Just getting past that screen, you, you deserve respect. So, uh, but it's worth a go because it was written by Douglas Adams. Anyway. Um, also, I'm writing a book. Um, O'Reilly have given me this, bar this, this code here, so feel free. It'll give you a month free on the platform. Uh, this is not, by the way, the final cover. Before anyone asks, uh, I don't know what the animal will be for the book. Uh, I will know when you know, probably. Uh, but this, this is my book. There's about four chapters worth of it available live on the O'Reilly website in the early release form. So feel free. I would love feedback. I'm actually writing to about chapter 7 out of 14 at the moment. And I think it's predicted to be in the shops sometime towards the end of next year. Hopefully, if I get my, my, my act together and get it done. But um, yeah, dig in. And also, I shall be putting a shout out for reviewers soon. So if anyone's interested in reviewing the book when it's half finished, reach out to me on Twitter and... Um, I will I will put you on the list. So, are there any questions, sir? Uh, did you answer it? I'm s I played the Star Trek uh, uh, game last evening. You played the Star Trek game. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's good. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> and and also, if it's interesting, could you show us the bang uh, timing in the order? Oh, I don't have it to hand. The bang in the old timing. Oh, it, um, I that I have a get get come over to me at some point. I'll try and find it for you. It did, the the there was no concept of files in the old days, you pr you m and um, the thing literally is five thousand lines of text. So I will find it for you. It's somewhere near the end. Um, come come find me, and I'll try and find the bang for you. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting bang, so, uh, okay, I, I, I'll try and put that in the slides maybe at some point, but sure, absolutely, come find me and I will find the bang. It's, um, so yes, uh, any more for any more? Sir? How many lines of code are in your version? How many lines of code are in my version? I don't know, frankly. Is it I more no, it's definitely a lot shorter than the original by a considerable amount. I mean, there's all sorts of features for reuse that we can make you, I mean, as, <laughs> As much fun as I have at the expense of the 1975 version, they didn't have anywhere near the number of features we have now. Um, my version is a lot shorter and also split over many files, so it's an awful lot easier to read, but I can't be too smug because like, you know, I'm working in Visual Studio 2020. <laughs> they didn't have that facility, but yeah, it, it, it is a lot shorter. But uh, I, I, it's not the first time I've been asked that, so I really ought to just have a count so I can have that that statistic to hand. But uh, um, have a, it's, I'm, I'm planning to put this all up on GitHub for people to play, so uh, you can always work it out for yourself. It's probably a couple of kilobytes when compiled. It's probably a couple of kilobytes when compiled. There's a very good chance of that. It is going to be tiny. I mean, it's just text. There's nothing else. So yeah, it probably is pretty. It's actually probably still going to be bigger than the original, though. The original was literally text. Um, mine will be compiled and it'll have all sorts of like you know executable bump in it. But uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, any, any, sir. Uh, I believe there is a successor to uh, another of Jack's uh, patents to make the anonymous tailwind recursion possible. Okay, you believe there's a way to use anonymous functions to use tail in a tail recursion? Okay, that maybe you and I need to have a. Okay, you're not sure if it's working. Okay, that's that's interesting. Maybe you and I can have a conversation because if there are ways to make it work, and I have I have tried to do my best to to find out what can be done, but so far this um, it's often called trampolining the method I've got, which really is shorthand for hiding a while loop. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people put all sorts of sophisticated stuff around it, but it's really hiding a while loop. Uh, okay, and any further questions, sir? Okay, did, did I have any goal in mind for, um, for when I did this project? Well, kind of, as a, to be honest, as I stated at the beginning, my main goal was I am incredibly bored, I'm locked in the house, I want something to do. Now, I am actually interested in functional programming, so I thought this would be a nice exercise for myself to extend my, my like, practice at social, uh, functional programming in, uh, in C Sharp, and I did come across some nice stuff. Um, it was certainly a great use for, for the um, uh, discriminated unions that you saw there. That was, that was, that was quite fun to do. Um, I generally do advocate for functional programming. I think there should be more of it in production. I have another talk that I do called Functional Programming C Sharp, which is a little bit more 
aimed at production code. This one is me having some fun in a way. But certainly things like discriminated unions with the switch, I would absolutely use that extensively. That's an incredibly powerful technique. So yeah, it's, it's a combination of me having fun and also me showing folks some nice ideas you could go ahead right now and use in production if you wanted to. If, if that's, yeah. Sir. There's always one, I told you. <laughs> There's always one. Right, F sharp. Uh, where's the exit? Uh, <laughs> oh. Okay. Right. You're after. You're interested to see a comparison with F sharp to see what what how much better, worse, or anything it might be if it were in sh F sharp. Uh, is, is that correct, sir? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, first off, I don't know F sharp. I'm not an F sharp developer. I've got some friends that are. And I probably could ask them to do something for me, but m the focus of my work is, is C-sharp. I am a C-sharp developer, and so my, my whole goal is functional C-sharp. That's an interesting exercise, and I might have a look into that. But, um, but no, I'm, I, I, I don't, at the moment at least, I don't really have any interest in F-sharp myself. I might well learn it. That might be on the back burner for next year or the year after as a thing I learn, but for the time being at least. And my day job is C-sharp, so as much fun as this was, um, it is also directly useful for my work because I took some of these techniques back and I actually implemented them in live systems in the company I work for. So this is directly useful plus fun. But my, my company doesn't use F-sharp, so that would be less useful. That's why I didn't pursue that route. But it's an interesting idea. And I might get one of my, my F-sharp buddies to, to have a look and see. No. no. <laughs> to have a look at uh, what could be done there. Uh, any more questions? Sir. Uh, I'm not actually using dependency injection. Well, I am and I'm not. I'm not using an, uh, uh, an inversion of control container. Um, I don't do that. I do use dependency injection as a pattern, if you see what I mean. Actually, all I do is instantiate the game engine in the uh, program.cs and then directly feeds the real types in. But then in my unit tests, I access the subclass directly. So I follow the pattern, but I don't actually use a container. For such a small game, I, I think that's acceptable. Do I think there's a good pattern for using dependency inject? It's not something I dwell on a lot. I've seen people do things with static objects, but that makes me nervous. So I, I mean, we're always going to have to compromise. C-sharp's never going to be pure functional. It never will be. And we ha so this, I think, is a perfectly acceptable solution. Uh, it might not be perfect, it may not be 100% functional, but it's acceptable and it doesn't cause me to lose any sleep. So, uh, any more questions? No, going once, going twice, then I declare this meeting the Midnight Society over. Thank you. Oh, and there's my Twitter. Thank you.